my name is Zachary Beckettall, National Master and Chess Coach here at Port Air Academy. I'm going to be here teaching you a 12 week series I'm excited about. These are 12 lessons that I use through a year to take anybody playing chess, but mostly my K-12 students from beginner, never played the chess game before, to being able to compete in a chess tournament. So uh, these lessons teach you the rules, teach you uh, all the uh, piece movements and check and checkmate, all the things you need to know about chess. And then we take you all the way up to the point where you should be able to use strategies, play in a tournament, and feel pretty comfortable on the chessboard. Not just play in a tournament and lose all your games, but hopefully compete and know what you're doing. Uh, this is going to be a real fun series, and I'm really excited to teach everyone. I recommend that you know you put this on your computer or your DVD player, and then you go back as many times as you need to. Up here on the board, I'll just go through everything once, but you may need to see it twice or three times. One of my favorite chess teachers is Nas. At Kachian, and based on his uh, strong accent and also how quick he goes on the chessboard, I've watched a lot of his lessons three or four times, but by the end of it, I feel like three or four times in, I've really learned a lot and uh, they're good lessons. So if you know it really well, uh, you know, speed right through the first few lessons, and if you need a little extra help, don't feel bad pausing it, rewinding it, making sure you get it all down. So today we're just going to start with the very basics of how to move the chess pieces and how everything works in chess so you get the rules down, which is very important. Obviously, if you're not off to that kind of good foundation, you're in some serious trouble. So to start, we're just going to go over all the piece names, and I'm going to have all the pieces up here so that uh, we can see how they're set up, and then we'll go over how each one moves. So to start the chessboard, you have all of these pieces here, which we call pawns. These ones go in front of the rest of your army, and they defend, uh, kind of kind of guard the pieces behind them, the big pieces behind them. They're small guys, but they're also very important. And you can see that here we have the white side, and here we have the black side. The white side's going against the black side, and as you play chess, each side gets one turn to make a move with any one of their pieces, and their opponent gets one turn. And to win the game, you have to checkmate the king, which basically means surround him. And don't worry, we'll learn that later, but this is the king right here, and uh, he's going to be your most valuable piece. He's not very powerful, but the way chess works, if you lose your king, you lose the game. And so, so we have the pawns here in front, then we have the king sitting here in the center, and then the queen beside him. And the queen, adversely, you don't lose the game if you lose the queen. However, she's the most powerful piece on the chessboard. So as, as we have that kind of dynamic in chess, we've got to be very careful and keep the queen safe. Most of the time, we'll leave the queen back when we play, and we'll make sure she's safe till later on in the game. Then in the corner of the chessboard, you have the rooks, which lots of players call castles, but any good chess player would know that you definitely need to call them rooks. And beside them, you have knights, and uh, looking like horses, and then you have bishops. And each piece on the chessboard comes from the English culture. Chess started back in India, and, uh, and it's moved from there, and had all kinds of different variations that they played with different rules, and the knights used to be elephants, and there was different pieces, and it's changed and moved, and the board and the numbers have all changed, and when it finally got to England, and England had this massive culture, it kind of took over chess and brought the chess that we know today that's now played internationally, which is really neat because if you're playing chess, uh, you know, here or with some uh, person that doesn't speak your language or anywhere in the world, they'll play the same variation of chess, which is pretty neat. And it's got the English culture to it, so that's why we've got the kings and the queens and the knights and the bishops and the rooks and such like that. And uh, if you're wondering, pawns are the, uh, the small guys are considered basically like a foot soldier or just, just a regular everyday guy. I think you can look it up on Wikipedia. Some of them are like the cooks and the chefs. And then, uh, and then I'm trying to think one's like the blacksmith. And so it's kind of like your everyday average, average dude here. Um, but the cool thing about the pawns is if they can make it all the way across the board, we call that promoting and you can turn them into something bigger. So we're going to get into that, but we're actually going to start our chess game by learning how each piece moves. So I'll leave the black pieces on up there, and you can kind of keep in mind that's how you set up the chessboard up there. And then we'll just kind of use this blank space here to practice moving our pieces today. And if I were you, I'd set up a chessboard beside uh, you know, your TV and uh, maybe practice a few times, pause in between each piece, make sure you kind of understand how it works. We'll start with the king. 
Not a very hard piece to move. The king just moves one square in any direction. So when you're moving the king, uh, you always play chess with one hand, you pick him up, you make a move. Now, after you move, it's going to be your opponent's turn. He'll get to make a move, any piece he wants to, and then uh, you can move again. So this king just goes in one square anywhere around. You can go straight or diagonal or kitty corner, and you can go this way. Any of these squares is perfectly fine for the king. So I might as well just real quick put some stars on the board so that we make sure we have a nice clear view of how the king moves. So all the way around him, to any square there's a star there, the king would be able to move. Not too hard. Any direction. Okay. So now that we've got the king, not too hard of a piece, we'll move on. The next piece we're going to learn is our rook here. So this is our rook when we put him on the board. Now, rooks are much more powerful pieces. They can move up and down side to side on a straight or, or a parallel or perpendicular axis, and they can go as far as they want to. So this rook can come all the way over here on one turn, wait for your opponent. Next turn, you can move this rook all the way back, all the way across the board. And, and just as it can move all the way across the board, it can also move one square at a time. So this piece can also move right here, and then it turns over, or it can move up. Uh, it can't go in L. So the only confusing thing is, like, you couldn't move the rook this way and then down all in one turn. You'd have to move straight, and when you got to the direction you wanted, you wait, and then if you're going to go down, you're going to take. So, for example, and to make that more clear, if there was a pawn here, first thing you'd want to do is line your rook up with it, then you'd have to wait for your opponent to move. And if we wanted to take this star, then we could come up and capture. Now, a star is not a real chess piece. I'm just using that as an example. Then when we capture a chess, we move our piece to the square the other piece is on. We take this, keep it on our side of the board, and we'd be ready for our opponent's move. So there's our rook. Also, on the chessboard, very important piece is the bishop. You can see kind of the funky character the bishop is. It's, it's like a, a pope or um, a bishop in chess. It's like, you know, the church guys with the big hats. And you kind of see this fold in them. They've got the big hats, and then they've got the fold that comes in the hat. And so that's what the bishop represents. When you have these nice, delicate sets, they'll even have like a full, actual uh, human character with the bishop hat on top. And so there's our bishop. Bishops move the opposite of rooks. So just as rooks move straight in every direction, bishops move diagonally. So bishops go like this or like this. So if we used, uh, used our stars to make sure it's nice and clear again, this bishop could go this way, it could go this way, it could go this way, or it could go this way. It could go as far as it wants to, so it could go to these squares as well. So we could go all the way down here, all the way this way, all the way here, all the way here. And the interesting thing in chess is you get one bishop that starts in the dark squares and one bishop that starts on the white squares. And so you get to use both to control all the squares on the board, but this white bishop is limited to just the black squares on the board, or the dark squares as we call them, and this one's limited to just the white squares on the board. So we usually call rooks a little more powerful because they can at least get to all the squares, but the nice thing about bishops is just like rooks, they can go all the way across the board diagonally in one turn. But don't let that fool you, it can also just move one square at a time if it needs to. So, bishops are good pieces, and uh, you can see how we can strategically find some good ways to use our bishops. Okay, so, bishops move diagonal. We get one of the white squares, one of the black squares. They can move as far as they want to. Uh, let me just move it around a little more. So here I can move all the way this way, I can even take this pawn. Or I can move one square, and then the next turn I can go this square, and then the next turn I can go all the way up here. Okay, now, after our bishop comes our knights. Our knights start in the middle of the board, or well, they, they start right here beside the rooks, and we're gonna put this one in the middle of the board, and then look at some of the squares it can go to. So I'm definitely gonna use the stars on this one because knights are tricky, and make sure you have this movement down because it's one of the tougher ones in chess. So when we move the knights, they're the only piece that can jump over other pieces, which makes sense, and they go in L. So when you move a knight, you go one, two, and then one over when you move. So uh, let's put this knight back here. We know we can go to this square now, uh, and it just goes in an L, which is the easiest way to show it kind of down and over. And if there's any pieces in between, it just jumps over it, no problem. So for example, we could take this knight up here, since it's sitting there, it jumps over one, two, one, and that'd be a good first move for your knight if you were the black pieces. So that's kind of the start we'd like. So this knight could go down one, two, and over one. It could go sideways one, two, and down one. It could go sideways, one, two, and then up one. 
Uh, remember, we go over two and up one, but it's the same thing if we went up one and over two. So same piece. Up one, two, and over one. Up one, two, over one. Over one, two, up one. Over one, two, down one. And so those are all the moves this knight could make in this position. He'd have eight squares that he'd go to in a big circle around him. Only go to where the stars are. It, it, sometimes you think, okay, great, you can move an else, but if I want, I can move in one, uh, no such luck. You have to move your knight over two and up one, where it at least has to go in that L shape. And it only captures the piece that it lands on. It doesn't capture anything in between here in this massive square. If, you're, if you're, your opponent's piece is on the pawn, great, you can capture it. If it's not, you can't capture it if it's like right here. If we have an opponent's piece, like a pawn sitting here, you have to jump over it. You're not allowed to capture it. Okay, so there's our knight. He opts around, he's going to be a good strategic piece too. Some people love the knight, including myself. Very tricky piece, hard to see it coming because it moves in those L's and so a lot of people will miss where it's going next and that can be really nice. So we got knights, bishops, rooks, now let's put our queens on the board. Our queens, like I said, very powerful and the easiest way to put a queen and why I, I, I did it in this order is because a queen is like moving a rook and a bishop combined. So. Uh, here, if, uh, if you have a queen, it's kind of like saying I have a rook and a bishop behind itself because they could move straight or they could move diagonal. Okay, now that doesn't mean they get two moves. I'm not trying to say that, but this queen could go diagonal this way on one turn or it could go straight this way, which means that it can get to a lot of squares. I don't even have enough stars to describe how many squares it could get to here because it could go all the way here and land or it could go all the way here and land. We're all the way down in land, and like all the other pieces, it can also just move one square at a time if it wants to. So it's like the king, it can go one square all the way around it, but it can go as far as it wants to. It can go all the way here, or all the way here. And so our queen's a very valuable piece in, um, in chess. And we've got to keep it safe in the beginning and try to use it as wisely as we can. Um, and while I'm talking about the queen, uh, we talked about the pawns earlier. If these pawns move and make it all the way across the board, normally we'll turn them into a queen and that'll be a really nice strategy too. And so, uh, so with that in mind, if we have a pawn on our chessboard, let's, let's learn how to move these. The pawns all start on the this, this seventh and second row in chess, and when you have a pawn, it's going to move one or two squares on its first turn. Now, um, after its first turn, it only moves one. So if we move a pawn one, after that we've got to make sure to just move it one at a time after. Okay, now, unlike all the other pieces, let's say we move our pawn to, let's say this pawn moves to two, now this guy is actually stuck. Uh, usually we can just jump on top of our opponent's piece and take it. With every other piece in chess you can do that, but with pawns it's not the same. When they run into obstacles, they're just blocked. They're just blocked, they can't do anything. And the way a pawn captures is actually diagonal. So this pawn is waiting, can't do anything, and if another piece comes to one of these two squares forward, it can capture it. The other sad thing about pawns, they only move forward. They don't move back. So if, if there's anything behind it, it can't take it. If there's anything sideways, it can't take it. Um, if this guy ends up getting taken or captured or leaves later on, then this pawn could move forward again, and then it would be able to capture pawns on these squares. And if it was White's turn and White moved his pawn up here, uh, then he'd have a chance to take one of these pawns next turn, but there's a good chance that Black would also go ahead and capture him this turn because his pawns could take forward diagonally. Now, I said they could take forward diagonally, but that does not mean that they can just move forward diagonally. There has to be a piece on that square diagonally to move that way or else they just go straight. And remember, when they get to the end of the board, let's clear out some black pieces here and just pretend like somehow this guy slipped past the, white, the black defense Let's say he moved two, and then on the next turn you moved one, and then on the next turn you moved one, and then on the next turn you moved one, and then you made it to the end. Then this piece actually gets to promote. Now obviously it doesn't happen that easily most of the time. Your opponent's careful not to let you do this, but later on in the game you have more of a chance to when there's less pieces on the board. This guy will now turn into a queen, and in chess we call that promoting. You can also underpromote to a rook or a knight or a bishop, but it's not very popular because the queen's so powerful. So when we promote, we actually uh, take this pawn off the board, he goes away, and the he turns into a queen. So then the queen starts on this square. Don't put your queen somewhere else. 
He starts over here. And then another thing to remember is you can have as many queens as you want to. So if white could get another pawn across the board, obviously here we don't even have white's pieces set up, but if you can get more pawns to the other side of the board, you can get two and three and four queens in chess. Uh, you really don't need that many, but most chess sets come with at least one extra queen, so you can use that uh, if you need to. The other thing you can do is the rooks are usually made so that if you flip them upside down, they'll still land that way, they'll be able to stand up. And so when you get a pawn across the board, you can turn it into a, a, a rook upside down, and everybody in chess will know that that's a queen, and you can use that as an extra queen if you're already using your one queen. And so, uh, obviously, if one queen's powerful, two queens is even more powerful, and it's a great way to beat your opponent. So, um, that's, that's an important part of the game, is promoting with our pawns and getting them across the board and turning them into queens. So, let's put these pieces back. Uh, now we're going to talk about some other strategies in chess and some other rules that we need to know. First thing we need to know is how to win the game, obviously. So, how to win the game is we checkmate this poor little white king, and then he's all that's left here, we'll say. So this king is uh, all alone, and um, black is going to try to attack him, so let's just move some pieces out. Uh, in chess, whenever the white king is under attack, even in the first few moves, if, if a black piece, like let's say this queen is here, and remember I'm just moving pieces, don't, don't, don't think the queen could jump over the pawns like this, I'm just putting it there. But if the queen could come down and attack the king, uh, and he's under threat, we call that check. So that means basically warning to white, he needs to move out of check, his king's under attack. Now in chess, and a weird thing about chess, especially for people who haven't played a lot, is it seems like if white accidentally moved to a square that was still check or made a mistake, we'd be able to just chop his king off the board. But that's actually not so. In chess, you're not allowed to take the king. You need to surround it in what we call checkmate. So if your opponent makes a bad move and stays in check, you actually have to give him a retry, take the move back, and make him move somewhere out of check. And then when he moves out of check, you can continue to try to get him in checkmate. So like a popular checkmate is something like this, where let's say we have a rook that goes straight, remember, so it can go straight all the way down and guard all these rows, and the queen can go straight and guard all these rows. Now this king is in check from this rook, but the king has no way to get out of check because it can only move one square in any direction around it. So since the king has no way to get out of check, in chess we call this checkmate, and this means black wins the game. You shake hands with your opponent, you call it good, you set him back up and you have to try again. And so this is the end of the game. This is what we're looking for. And there's many, many, many different ways to get checkmate, but the main thing is that white's king is, is under attack and he has no way to get out. Uh, there's a few ways that white has a possibility of getting out. If he has like a rook here, he could actually block check. That's perfectly allowed. Or if he had, let's say, his own queen over here, he could, uh, he could go diagonal and take black's rook to get out of check. Those would all be good ways to get out of check. But since he's in this position with no way out of check, it's checkmate and the game is over. Okay, so that's what we're looking for. Now, there is one mercy rule. Say we have a position like this. Let's say the king's in the corner where black is just mopping up white. And this kind of mercy rule is if black puts white in a position where he can't go to any square, but he's not in check, we call this stalemate. And this is actually a tie game. So this is a very important part of the chess game where uh, instead of black winning, even though he's got all these pieces, a tie. And it's kind of a mercy rule, I think, where even if you're losing by a lot, you can still hope for something. Here, it's uh, it, the king can't move to any of these squares because of the queen's ability to go straight and diagonal. So since all these squares are taken, let's just put some stars on them. Stars are fun. And he can't go to any of these squares, and he's not in attack. It's stalemate. Now, everybody's really confused probably at this point wondering what's the difference from stalemate and checkmate. And the check is the big difference. Here, uh, black surrounded the white king. That's what he wanted to do, but he didn't put him under attack. So if we just move this work down and, and had this position with white to move, now it's checkmate. Because now, black's put him in check and there's nowhere to move. But if it's this position and it's white's move and white has no moves, and he's not in check, that's stalemate. So that's a little tricky, but hopefully you kind of grasp that concept a little bit and you'll pick it up more and more over time. So last thing we want to go over, and I'm going to set the board up for this, is a couple special moves that they let you do in chess. And the first one is castle. So in chess, it's very important to keep our king safe. And so this rule pertains to a good strategy to keep your king safe. You by no means have to do castling, but if you look at any good player in chess, 
They cancel almost every game. So you're going to want to do this. So here's the deal. We have the board set back up with our rooks in the corner, our knights, bishops, our royalty in the middle, and our pawns in front. Notice the queen is always on a white square if it's a white queen, a black square if it's a black queen. She's picky, we like to put her on her square color. So uh, remember to set the board up right. Also remember, the board has letters and numbers, A through H, one through eight, and that's a good way to, uh, to know which square you're on here. This would be E3, this would be A4. So get good at your chess notation if you could practice that. And when we, when we have boards that have letters and numbers, we put white on the first two ranks, black on the seventh and eighth rank. So that's important to know too. If you put your board backwards, people are going to think you're a beginner. Um, so, castling is a special move. Let's say we push our pawn, we use our double move first. Let's just make some moves for black. Let's say he does the same thing. Remember, these pawns can't take each other. Then this knight hops out one, two, and over one. This knight goes one, two, and over one. And then we move our bishop, which goes diagonal. So we're getting some good, good scenes of how this will work. And black does the same thing, moving his bishop diagonal. And then white has an open road between his king and his rook. And there's these two squares that are open, and he hasn't moved his king or his rook. If you moved your king or your rook, you can't castle. You can do the special move. Now, we said kings could only move one square at a time, but when you castle, you can move your king two squares, and then move your rook over the top, all in one turn. And what that does is now the king is safer on the side of the board. He usually does much better in the corner over here. And then these pawns can protect him, so we want to keep these pawns here. And, and that's how castling works. Um, so you can't castle if you're in check. You also can't castle if you've moved these pieces, like we said. So it's, it's only a very specific move. You've got to use it at the beginning. You've got to use it uh, when it works. You can also castle on moving some other pieces on the other side of the board, perfectly allowed. And in castle, I, I said, you know, you usually do it early, and that's true, but it's perfectly allowed to do it later, as long as you haven't moved your king or the rook on the side you're castling on. And what we'll do when we castle on the queen side, which is, you know, the side where the queen is over here, we move the king one, two. Remember, you always move the king two. When you play chess, you always play with one hand, so we just move the king two. And then we pick up the rook, one, two, three, all in one turn. We get to move two pieces. Now it's our opponent's turn, and our king's much safer over here on the edge of the board where we like it. So that's an example of castling. So now you know uh, how all the pieces move in chess. You know uh, how check and checkmate works in chess. You know pawn promotions in chess. Uh, you know stalemate, check, and checkmate. Might have said that already. And um, you've learned castling. So we're off to a good start. Next week we'll get into more of uh, how we're actually going to move the pieces around. Make sure you watch this video as many times as you need to so you know how to move all those pieces and you have that little checklist down and we'll build off this foundation. Thanks for listening. We're looking forward to uh, some more good weeks coming up and uh, keep playing chess until then.